We've just witnessed an exciting 24 hours of Le Mans, capping off a very long super season of WEC which saw the Toyota team dominate. But back in 1999, a very different team, Mercedes, was expected to flatten the competition at the Circuit de la Sarthe, but did the exact opposite in more ways than one. This is the story of how Mercedes flipped their car into the air three separate times during the Le Mans weekend, withdrawing from the race a few hours in and never returning again. Nowadays, the 24 Hours of Le Mans is a flagship race that sits as part of the World Endurance Championship, but in 1999 it wasn't particularly attached to any championship. Mercedes sports cars had just dominated the FIA GT Championship in the GT1 class for the previous two years to such an extent that the competition mostly packed its bags and went home. With so few entries, the FIA suspended the GT1 class, but the ACO, which organises the Le Mans race, had recently created the LM GTP class, Le Mans GT prototype. This class existed for cars based on production road cars, but that had evolved to the point of being too advanced and too quick for any standard GT class. This meant Mercedes and other manufacturers could design advanced GT type cars specifically for Le Mans and not have to consider a wider championship. As Le Mans is quite a unique circuit, very fast and very long, the details of which we'll get into in a bit, this meant the LMGTP cars could be incredibly Le Mans specific. Though they had proved themselves formidable in GT1, Mercedes still had something to prove at Le Mans, after retiring all of their cars a sixth of the way through the 1998 race due to various technical problems. In 1999, they could focus all their efforts on the glory and prestige of a Le Mans top step trophy. And so they made the Mercedes CLR, an incredibly sleek and powerful evolution of their CRK model. The car hadn't shown itself particularly dominant in May testing, and it's safe to say Mercedes hit the drawing board hard between testing and the Le Mans event in June. And it was there that things started to go very wrong. Mark Webber, in the number four car, crashed out of Thursday qualifying. Though not captured on camera, it was clear from Mark's later description that the car had unexpectedly launched into the air, flipped over, and landed back on track. It happened so fast it was like an aeroplane taking off. At this point I was probably doing close to 300 kilometers an hour. I could see the sky, then the ground, then the sky again. Luckily Weber was shaken but largely unhurt. His car had already qualified by that point and he was allowed to continue in the event, albeit with a replacement rebuilt chassis. All three Mercedes had qualified inside the top 10, but none at the front of the grid. Mercedes made some changes to the rear suspension, added some cascades to the front of the car to so add a bit of downforce just to be safe. Not safe enough though. In the pre-race warm-up session, Mark Webber took off and flipped through the air again. Once more, he managed to avoid leaving the circuit and fly into the trees, landing back on track, though this time on his roof. He was out of the race before it even started. Surely there was something very wrong with the Mercedes CLR car. But if there was, Mercedes themselves weren't overly concerned as their two other cars started the race later that day. And then on lap 75, five hours into the race, the inevitable happened. Mercedes' number five car, in the hands of Peter Dumbreck, took to the sky as he was chasing the Schroeters down for the lead. It flipped over two, three times, clearing the Armco barrier and landing among the trees lining the circuit. Dumbreck was thankfully okay, taken to the hospital and deeply in shock, but otherwise okay. A tree had punctured the car, missing both the seat and the fuel tank. At this point, Mercedes did withdraw its final car from the race, as it seemed their chassis had a certain unexplainable penchant for taking to the sky. Mercedes had aimed high, but the car had aimed somewhat higher. So what on earth happened? What made that Mercedes CLR so prone to taking off at Le Mans? Though Mercedes were somewhat unlucky, though very, very lucky considering the potential injuries they avoided on three separate occasions, it comes mostly down to a matter of their drive to push the design of their car beyond the limits in which it could hold aerodynamic stability. Let's break it down a bit. As mentioned, Mercedes built the CLR car specially to take on the Circuit de la Sarthe, the monster track that hosts the Le Mans 24 hour. For fans of F1, La Sarthe can be kind of thought of as a mega combination of Monza and Spa. It's very, very fast, full of extremely long straights, fast corners, chicanes, and heavy braking zones. The cars are at full throttle for over 85% of the lap and will be at top speed for extremely long times before diving into hard braking zones. It's a real test of power, aerodynamic slipperiness, and the endurance of the brakes, suspension, and engine. Your car needs to have a good trade-off between being low drag to reach the super high top speeds down the long, long straights, and having enough downforce to keep up through the high speed corners and wiggly sections. But let's be honest, it's the long straights that dominate your approach to this track. 
Mercedes made their car as slippery as possible. It was low, it was sleek, there was barely a visible seam or rivet crossing the length of its body. The car was made to slide through the air like a ghost through a tennis racket. On top of this, while the Mercs were designed to be as long as legally possible, they shortened up the wheelbase, that is, the distance between the front and rear axle. Normally, you'd aim for a long wheelbase, as this gives the car more stability through the corners. To help picture this, imagine a very short wheelbase car versus a very long wheelbase car, and you can see the short wheelbase car is more prone to rock back and forth all over the place as it brakes, accelerates, or has any front rear imbalance, whereas the long wheelbase car will be much more planted with its wheels right at the edges. So why did Mercedes shorten their wheelbase? In order to maximise the overhangs. The overhangs are the part of the car that extend beyond the wheels of the car, front and back. This is where, on the floor of the car, you'll have your front and rear diffusers. Diffusers essentially suck the car onto the ground from below, and being able to lengthen your diffuser by lengthening the overhang that it attaches to, you can increase your underbody downforce. This is super important as Mercedes were trying to limit their overbody downforce significantly to reduce drag and aim for mega top speeds. Underbody generated downforce is much less draggy, so shifting as much of the aerodynamic work as possible to underneath the car will help reduce the drag of your chassis. Furthermore, in the aim of cutting down overbody downforce even further, Mercedes neutralised the pitch angle of their car. Most race cars run at a negative pitch angle. That is, the front runs lower to the ground than the rear, so you essentially tilt the whole body of the car so it works as a downforce generating tool in itself. Of course, this leads to drag, so it's a bit of a trade-off as with all wing type devices. Most cars in the LMGTP class would run at a pitch of about minus two, minus two and a half-ish, but Mercedes brought this closer to a flat zero, minus 0.7 degrees at most. As with all race engineering, Mercedes were chasing every last bit of performance. In neutralising the pitch though, they took a lot of downforce off the front end of the car, which will have consequences. So what we now have is a very pitch sensitive car. That means it's not particularly stable in the rocking front to back sense. If you brake hard, the car will dip its nose. If you accelerate hard, the car will rock backwards. Undulations and bumps in the road will unsettle the pitch, as will disruptions in the airflow ahead. Weber's qualifying crash came on the run down to Indianapolis Corner, where the track was notoriously quite bumpy. He was also running in the slipstream of another car, which would have disrupted the downforce at the front of the car, while the bumpy tarmac would have induced a wobble. It was found that as the pitch of the car rose from zero to about positive two degrees, the front downforce disappeared dramatically, so much so that it flipped and actually became lift. This is partly due to the fact that the cockpit of the car is a lift generating shape that the rest of the car has to counter, and partly due to the nature of presenting a car to the air at a lifted angle. The centre of pressure moves aggressively towards the front and starts lifting the car. This can begin to start a chain reaction as there's a big imbalance between the front and rear of the car. The rear is still very much planted with its big rear wing and even lower diffuser. The front is now causing lift, which produces torque in the overall length of the car, a rotation centred around the rear axle. And once the car reaches just 2.4 degrees, we reach a critical point. At this point, the lift produced by the car is greater than its downforce. This means the car as a whole is being pushed in a net upwards direction. The whole car, at this upturned angle, is acting like an aeroplane wing. From here, the car takes off and continues to flip front over back, and the driver has nothing to do but hope they land safely away from trees and people. Scary stuff. Mark Webber's qualifying crash wasn't captured on camera, and according to Webber's autobiography, Mercedes didn't quite believe what had happened. In preparation for the race, after consultation with Asian Nui, who reportedly told them to withdraw from the race entirely, Mercedes strapped on some aero flick ups to the front of the car for added downforce and reportedly stiffened the rear suspension. A softer rear suspension can be useful as it will cause the rear end of the car to sink at high speeds and further neutralise the pitch angle of the car. Reducing the tendency for the car to tilt on its rear axle would also help mitigate the potential for the car to suddenly rise up at the front. Unfortunately, it didn't really work all that well, as we soon saw. Weber's warm-up lap flight happened off the crest of a hill while following another car. Reduced downforce due to the slipstream and the car's pitch with the road changing as the car crests the hill combined into another complete lift for Weber and he was out of the event. Dumbrecht's accident later in the day was again over the crest in the road and in the slipstream of another car. The Mercedes CLR was just too pitch sensitive, and if a couple of factors added up to lift the front of the car slightly, it could suddenly and unexpectedly reach a point of no return and fly into the air. In the pursuit of top speeds and aerodynamic slipperiness, Mercedes built a car that was just too prone to popping its nose just a fraction too high and launching into the French sky. 
After investigations, Mercedes withdrew from all its 1999 sports car programs and have not returned to Le Mans since. The ACO decreased the allowed overhang lengths in Le Mans entries and also decreased the hill on the Monsan Strait by 8 metres and smoothed out the bumpier parts of the track and road to reduce lift risk. The event has remained infamous in the history of both Le Mans and Mercedes motorsport and those who love sports cars hope to never see such things happen again.